so-called hedge knights travel the world in search of employment. Owning little but their arms, armor, and their horse, these landless nobles are shunned and disdained, except in times of war. With their blades for hire and supplying their own equipment, nobles from all sides of the War of Five Kings can find a use for a half dozen or so trained knights on the battlefield. That said, their equipment rarely matches that of true knights. Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and uh, in this video we're going to be talking about the Hedge Knights that are coming up for uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. So this video kind of preface, it's been a weird one to make because the this is the first time in the unit focus in the very small infancy of this uh, video series existence that I've had to tackle a neutral unit. And the Hedge Knights are even more so unique in that they are probably the first neutral unit that we've encountered in the game or neutral combat unit rather that hasn't had like a specific affiliation with it which is kind of neat when you think about like what they actually mean in the fluff and all that but uh you know other the, otherwise we've had you know the boltons the storm crows the mummers all these other things that kind of have a very specific pointed uh, you know, affiliation, but the Hedge Knights truly are just wandering knights, and uh, it's going to be interesting to try and see how we can string them together and present this unit in a light that makes sense in terms of figuring out how they fold into the current game's universe. So for those of you not quite familiar with the concept of a Hedge Knight in A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, George R. R. Martin did make a series. Uh, I believe the first book was just called The Hedge Knight. Um, and that kind of follows uh, a couple hedge knights around and, and like kind of takes a, a a look at their lifestyle and some of their trials and tribulations. I'm not a book expert and I haven't read through it. I've just kind of picked through some things. I would be interested if anyone has read through it that can pop up in the comments section and see and tell us if there's any kind of connection between some of the rules on the hedge knights or their attachments. And that book series as well. I think it would be a really cool touch. And, uh, you know, one of these days I'll get around to reading it. But it would be neat to know now. The Hedge Knights are a cavalry combat unit for the neutral faction. And come with four unique sculpts that not only serve as the representation of the unit. But each one of those also serves to represent the two attachments that come in the box. So this isn't a box that comes with extra models to do the attachment thing. This is a lot like how the... Uh, the uh, Dothraki veterans are in that the unit can be broken out to be attached to other cavalry units in the game. So as one could expect with the Hedge Knights based on their description, they don't have any build restrictions at all. They can really just plug in anywhere. But they come in at 7 points. And in terms of stats, they've got a 5 speed. They have a 4 plus defense save and a 7 plus morale. And then they have the King's Blade melee attack that hits on threes or better and has a 7-4 decay stat. They're also cavalry models, so they have all the rules that come with that. They have on their Knight's Blade, they get Sundering. And then they have an ability that states if you control the combat zone before rolling the attack dice, the defender becomes vulnerable. The final ability that the unit has is called Loyalty Through Coin. And this states while you control the Wealth Zone... This unit gains plus one defense to, or plus one to defense dice rolls and plus one to morale test rolls. So looking at the unit as a whole right away, this is a fairly inexpensive cavalry unit. Uh, the outside of the Dothraki, I believe, there's not really any cavalry that goes below uh, seven points. I think that's kind of like the entry level for most cavalry. And comparing them to other cavalry in the game, they definitely have a lot of value in, in lists if you're trying to save some points instead of adding some of your more specific ones. They don't do much in terms of supporting. They're just kind of, they, they do their job. They fight when, they, when you're controlling that zone really, or controlling the combat zone really well. Even if you're not, they still hit on threes, roll seven dice with Sundering, and they don't have any of the fun stuff that the rest of some of the more heavily armored cavalry has where they get the uh, the lance rule. Uh, but then this loyalty through coin ability is really cool. 
I know we've seen a lot of motivated by coin abilities, so I think this is the first time we've seen loyalty through coin. And just being able to do or to get the uh, these guys up to a three plus defense save and a six plus morale makes them pretty uh, survivable. And uh, I think that almost any army could fold these in, and they would get work done pretty well for the points that they're at. Another cool feature of this unit is that it can be split into combat attachments for cavalry models, which is something that I think the neutrals have wanted for some time. They don't really get the opportunity to uh, pick up attachments for their neutral units unless they happen to be playing in some other faction outside their, their, outside their own. So the first one is, they're both one-point attachments. The first one is the Fortune Seeker. They have the ability Dauntless, so each time this unit passes a morale test, it restores one wound. Then this particular attachment brings Motivated by Coin, and that just states that when a friendly NCU claims the Wealth Zone, you can replace that zone's effect with the Fortune Seeker's unit may perform one attack action. The other attachment that this unit brings along with them, or can bring along with them, is uh, the Glory Seeker, and they only get one ability on their card, and it's tied to their melee ability, and it says that when this unit performs, well, it's Rally Cry, but uh, when this unit performs a melee attack, before rolling the attack dice, one other friendly unit within long range restores two wounds. When I first saw the Hedge Knights and these attachments, I kind of had a initial feeling that the unit itself was pretty vanilla so these attachments were kind of meant to help the unit itself kind of claim a more solidified identity for eight points and when you look at it that way they definitely do that the attachments give them a stronger identity and point them in a specific direction but upon further like introspection I guess you could say this unit really isn't all that vanilla they have a lot of flavor in them in terms of you know getting to present different abilities depending on the zones that you control that kind of feed into this like mercenary type idea and really go goes towards like you know here's what these guys are here for and when you end up putting the fortune seeker or glory seeker in there it does give them a bit more of a fluff direction not to mention for one point you do get some pretty sweet abilities and uh when we look outside just the hedge knight unit itself uh these two attachments can really go a long way in a lot of different armies especially since uh cavalry attachments just are not as common outside of the the targaryens and this can definitely help elevate some of those other units that you might want to bring with you. Now, they do add that one extra point, which can take you from being more of that elite or like the, the medium, medium investment cavalry to becoming a more elite investment cavalry unit. But I think the two abilities that they end up bringing are worth way, they're well worth that one point, especially when we start looking at trying to. Uh, lean into strategies with these attachments in mind when they kind of line up with that strategy already. So uh, it's difficult to kind of talk about the Hedge Knights just on their own because the uh, the neutrals themselves, they really kind of build themselves a strategy off of the commanders. And at current, there really isn't a commander, in my opinion, that makes these things kind of come to life. All of the commanders for the neutral faction are really pointed in their own specific directions. Like, uh, you know, both Ramsey and Roos really like to do things that the Bolton infantry that they bring along with them does. And the Dario Naharis likes to do the things with Stormcrows because that's his specific deal. And even someone like Vargo Hote likes to have mummer stuff with him it's not that he needs it so much it's just that a lot of the things that they do end up playing into his strategy so if you find yourself needing cavalry that's just a little bit more heavily armored this is probably where you'd want to be plugging that unit into your neutral list it's not to say that they're bad for neutrals only but they just don't have those synergies that are already programmed into the commanders and we've already talked about how the neutrals themselves are heavily based off of the commander's ability to function or apply their uh, apply their specific game plan to the neutrals tactics deck because it's all about 
funneling cards back from the commander or getting the commander to activate and do special things. So hedge knights, I think they're going to be passed around a lot in the other factions, much more than they'll be utilized in neutrals. But with their price point, I do believe that there will be plenty of neutral players that are super happy to use these, if just for some hard-hitting cavalry that can do some really cool things. So given my thoughts that the hedge knights seem to per per perform better or present themselves better in factions outside of the neutrals, I want to take a look at one of the commanders that I think really sing really brings them to life quite a bit, and that's going to be Khal Drogo the Great Call for the Targaryen faction. Uh, Khal, Khal Drogo brings a alteration to the melee ability of the unit called Expert Duelist, and this just says each time this unit performs a melee attack, before rolling the attack dice, you choose one of the two modes. You either get to automatically deal one wound with this attack, or target one infantry attachment in the defender's unit and roll a die. On a three or better, you destroy that attachment. Kaldrogo also brings the ability Iron Resolve, where the unit gets plus one to panic test rolls and suffers neg one wound from failing panic test rolls. So just with the attachment of Khal Drogo outside of his commander cards, we, when we take Expert Duelist, it's almost like we're giving this unit that, uh, that lance ability that a lot of the other heavily armored cavalry units from other armies have, because, like, it's, you know, math is... The math, it varies from thing to thing based on what you're looking at, but you can probably think that two automatic hits could convert into one wound more likely than not, but just getting the one wound kind of makes it feel like you're just getting that ability automatically, and it's pretty decent because even if you're going into something heavily armored, you're guaranteed to start that panic check, or to get a panic check out of them with just automatically dealing one wound to them. Plus, I think that uh, attachments, like... The, the game has evolved in a way where the three NCU meta that used to be extremely present in the game, I feel like is kind of getting pulled away. I haven't really tested out any three NCU lists yet, so I can't speak from a position of uh, higher education than other people who've done this. But at least in my theory and practice, every time I'm building lists and playing lists, I feel much more at ease with two NCUs, and given that build restriction being lifted a bit, I think that that frees up people to start looking more at attachments, which I really think is a great thing for the game, but that means that the ability Expert Duelist is going to gain a lot more value because you can just go in and hunt really specific attachments that can uh, turn take a unit from being really good to being extremely dangerous and brutal. So I think that uh, just put, plugging Expert Duelist into this unit is going to be a, a, a welcome thing. Iron Resolve is another ability that this unit very much appreciates as well. They have that 7 plus morale stat without the coin zone being taken. And uh, just being able to kind of transfer that to the 6 plus morale. And at Cavalry likes to keep all of their wounds as much as possible. So taking minus 1 wound from that I think is going to be another... Uh, welcome buff to this unit and make sure that they stick around for a long time. The big benefit to having the uh, the Hedge Knights kind of carrying around Khal Drogo is that he is a, a pretty brutal commander in general, and the Dothraki themselves, which are really the only cavalry that's been available to uh, the Targaryens outside of other neutrals, they're not typically armored heavily. Um, I think there's been some experimentation from people to put Khal Drogo into flayed men. Um, they're quite expensive, and things in points go fast in a Targaryen list. So when we take something like the Hedge Knights that are a, you know a full point cheaper now, uh, I think that they can go a long way here, especially since we're putting them in a bunker that's got that four plus defense stave and, you know, can get up to a 5-plus morale, they're going to be sticking around a long time. And then if you do have that coin zone, you're going to be getting up to that 3-plus defense save. So it makes it very difficult to get Khal Drogo off the table, which typically is one of the ways that you kind of deal with some of his uh, cards that he ends up bringing that kind of enforce this brutality of that uh, cavalry force that the Dothraki or, or that the Targaryen, sorry, are bringing down with this type of list. Looking at Khal Drogo's commander cards that he ends up bringing, we can kind of see some of the power that 
uh, that he can utilize having a unit like the Hedge Knights kind of carting him around. The first one is that Adravat card, and uh, this just triggers when Khal Drogo's unit activates. You just attach this card to an enemy unit, and then if you... The while attached melee attacks against that enemy gain critical blow, and then when the enemy is destroyed, you gain one victory point. And if the card's removed uh, at the end of the round, and the unit hasn't been destroyed, the, your opponent gains one victory point. So I think the hedge knights actually bring enough oomph, especially with Drogo in the unit, to be able to uh, put out a lot of damage on a unit or on a unit for that you target with Adravat. But the uh, you know with the increased value that comes with something like the uh the dothraki outriders they can kind of pick things off from long range for a little while and then call drogo's unit can go in after they've lost some wounds and make sure they get this card to go through because you're rolling seven dice with sundering they could be getting vulnerable if you own that combat zone and then you're getting critical blow on top of that and then Expert Duelist as well, so I think that you're pretty well set by putting Khal Drogo in a unit like the Hedge Knights to make sure that you get this card the two times in a game that you need it. Uh, and of course, you can, at the start of a friendly turn, you can draw a Tactics card if Khal Drogo's not hanging around on the field or if you don't feel like you've got a good chance to do this, but I think that this is a good card to make sure that, or to showcase that the Hedge Knights are a decent unit for him. Now, ride by attack is just uh, not something I'll dwell on, but it's it, it's altered quite a bit and just lets you get some extra wounds when uh, a unit or with a unit that's cavalry. So of course it'll get the 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 hedge knights will get use out of it. Although I really don't feel like I would want to spend their whole activation just completing a march to do three auto wounds, but that's just me. Uh, out the next one is a big one for me, and this kind of ties into Adravat a little bit where. Uh, when you're, and this is assault orders, uh, it just triggers when a friendly NCU claims a zone, you can replace that zone's effect with one friendly combat unit makes one attack action, and if it targets Drogo's unit, they can do a charge action instead. So we've already kind of talked about the brutality of the Hedge Knights with Call Drogo attached to them, and assault orders just lets you get more mileage out of that unit. Uh, especially when targeting Khal Drogo's unit because you can just go ahead and charge off with them a couple times and your opponent's going to not really have a, a fun time recovering from that because the Dothraki stuff in general, at least to me, doesn't have that innate brutality that the Hedge Knights can have. You know, they're, they're getting sundering all the time and when you have that combat zone, whatever you charge is vulnerable or whatever you attack is vulnerable. And then... Uh, you know, with Khal Drogo on the unit, just charging off twice is a really big deal. Now, lead by example doesn't really directly tie into anything that the Hedge Knights are doing. I don't know if I would want to bring a unit of Hedge Knights on their own with uh, with a Khal Drogo led list, uh, but I I could see it. Um, I just haven't really like theoried out how to build that list quite yet to see if I would rather have Hedge Knights or a cheap unit of Screamers with an attachment or something, but still a, a good card for him regardless, but doesn't really like focus in on you know what we're looking at with the, uh, with the Hedge Knights specifically when being taken with him. Shifting our attention over to the attachments, I think that uh, there's so many options to really plug these these two into any unit to make them really work well but the first one that i want to take a look at is the fortune seeker and how he would plug into a unit of house bolton flayed men so the the flayed men themselves have a pretty righteous attack stat they are a little bit more on the expensive side so when you put the fortune seeker into this unit uh you're making them a nine point unit but i think what he brings ends up making them well worth that nine points the flayed men are going to be wanting to attack often and when they do their attacks are so brutal they have that they hit on threes they throw seven dice at full ranks they've got vicious and when they charge they gain critical blow plus they've got that Im intimidating presence that makes the morale test worse for your opponent so these guys should be able to do quite a hefty bit of damage and when we do something like throw the fortune seeker into that unit uh we end up making it so that it's harder for your opponent to remove them because they've already likely you've connected with them first with the uh, flayed men just based on the the you know the the sole function of 
well, not the sole function, but the, the, the mechanical function of cavalry is usually that it will connect first. So you're doing a bunch of damage right away, and if your opponent attacks you back, it'll be at a lowered efficacy because you've probably wiped a rank. And once you end up taking your morale test, which you're likely to pass because you have an above average morale stat, you'll just restore a wound, making it much more difficult for your opponent to start peeling off those flayed men ranks and make it more more difficult for you to actually uh, or make it more difficult for your opponent to actually start affecting that unit in a way that lowers their combat prowess. Giving them motivated by coin as well is another huge deal for them because they do like to attack often. And when you have this attached to them, it means when you connect, your opponent has to respond by taking one of those two zones. And typically, the you know it's it's bad either way for them. You're either getting that extra attack from taking the combat zone, or you're not only denying them healing but also making another attack with that that uh, with the wealth zone as well so i think the fortune seeker turns the flayed men unit into being very worth the nine points so the glory seeker is probably the attachment that i think i'm most excited about just because it kind of attunes itself to my preferred style of play and with rally cry you can kind of uh, get another option to try and keep churning the healing and continue a lot of this attrition play style that i find very valuable in a song of ice and fire and the unit that I appreciate it the most on right now it has got to be the Champions of the Stag. Now, I'm more of a Renly player than a Stannis player. It's not that I don't play him at all. It's just that I play Renly's side a little bit more. And not only does his side kind of lend itself better to the more healing aspect of the attrition focus that the unit can split itself into, but he also doesn't have a Renly loyalty cavalry attachment like Stannis does. And by plugging the Glory Seeker into the champ the champions of the stag unit, you increase their points just a bit to get to that same level that the the flayed men with the Fortune Seeker were. But this unit is always going to be attacking, and it's going to be attacking for a very long time because they've got that 2-plus defense save and the 6-plus morale, not to mention you've got other ways to kind of keep them healed up within the Baratheon tactics deck and Renly NCUs and other commander cards that come from his loyalty of things, or his loyalty side of things, but then the champions of the stag almost, uh, they kind of like absorb a lot of that healing because you don't want to lose a unit that is, you know, this effective. So what the Glory Seeker allows you to do is to start plugging wounds back into other units that might have been neglected because you focus a lot of your healing efforts on the champions of the stag. So for one point, you just kind of turn the, this unit into an engine of healing, and with most of the the units within the, uh, the stable of Renly's loyalty, uh, it's it can be very frustrating for your opponent to deal with having something like that happen where not only do they have to focus a lot of effort to get rid of the champions of the stag because they're so heavily armored, they also have to now start spending a lot more attention on the, or they have to split their attention to the other units in a little bit more of a committed way because you're, those are also heavily armored units and you're getting, you're plugging two wounds back into them every single time this unit attacks. And that means that your opponent's going to start wanting to take that uh, combat zone away from you before you get the chance to do it. Because if you're triggering the Glory Seeker's rallying cry like two or possibly three times in a turn, that's going to be six wounds back to a unit across a long range of... Uh, of or across the long range, right? So I, I think we've talked about it before about what the long range actually means on the influence of the table. Uh, you know, your your base itself as cavalry, I still believe, is just five inches, maybe a little over, a little under. I haven't, like, specifically measured it in a long time. But then when you broadcast 12 inches from each side of that, that's uh, what, uh, that's a 19 or 29 inch, you know, zone of influence on the table that you can start echoing wounds back to so regardless of the position of the champions of the stag you're going to find yourself very hard pressed to not be able to put wounds back where you need them to be and with them being cavalry although a little bit more chunky on the 
on their movement stat. They still have the maneuverability to get to other places to try and increase that broadcast of the bubble so that you can put wounds back where you need to. And I think that the, the Glory Seeker is going to be very frustrating for people to deal with in a healing-focused Renly list. So I feel like we've only scratched the surface of talking about the Hedge Knights and the attachments that they end up bringing with them. It's one of the reasons why I stated in the beginning of this video that it's very difficult to kind of talk about a unit like this because there are so many different ways you can utilize it and to just try and plug that into less than a 30 minute discussion it kind of does them a disservice there are so many other ways that you can start looking at this unit with other armies i you know i talked about the healing aspect with the glory seeker now put if you plug that glory seeker into the hedge knight unit itself and then bring it into something like the knight's watch you've kind of got this really devastating unit that your opponent has to deal with and uh while they're doing that you are also turning wounds back into the rest of your units because the Night's Watch is elite by nature anyways. You lose one of your targets for the, you know, the, the vows in quotes, but still just having that machine churning out those, uh, those wounds and having your opponent focus on that instead of your more elite units is a pretty valuable thing. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, not high level play, but like, a lot of high concepts that come with the hedge knights that are just more than, you know, this is just my my basic cavalry unit that I can plug in anywhere. And one of the things that I think is worth discussing, and I'm not sure if I can completely put a stamp on this and say this is how I completely feel about it, is the overall power level of the hedge knights. Now, in the past, uh, cavalry in neutrals has had a very... Uh, interesting history in that a lot of armies end up uh, borrowing those or it's something that make they, they focus in on it so much with the neutrals that they're able to take only those and that's just the way it is. I don't know if we're ever going to get to that point with the Hedge Knights. Like, you won't see any four Hedge Knight lists running around like you did with the old Flayed Men back when they were, you know, 10 points each. But I do think there is weight to the discussion point that there is a chance that the Hedge Knights might be a little too overperforming for their point value. I think seven points is fairly inexpensive when it comes to cavalry, and we can plug that into so many other armies where their cavalry might not be as um, innately desirable. Like, not that the Dothraki are not innately desirable. The Screamers are really great for six points, but when you're looking at trying to plug in uh, a, uh, a commander that's on a mount, the Hedge Knights just kind of seem like head and shoulders above anything else in that army to try and make sure that that commander sticks around and can do a lot of work. So I think time will tell to see if the Hedge Knights end up kind of uh, coming out as being a little too powerful for their points. I do think that they're, I, I was like slightly not shocked so much, but a little taken aback by there not being a little bit more restrictions baked into the the Hedge Knights themselves. Like, I half expected to see a rule on them that would say that you have to, ex you have to include a Glory Seeker or a Fortune Seeker on this unit, and that would pull them up to that eight points and make sure that you couldn't just kind of pepper, you know, whatever you wanted to in the unit, and they wouldn't become a a forever bunker for some of these mounted commanders. But uh, like I said, time will tell. I, I don't have the, the crystal ball, and I know I definitely don't have the uh, like an, a, a, a massive ability to be able to determine what is going to be broken in the future or not, because we just haven't had that, that kind of data presented to us, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. But I do think that the Hedge Knights are worth keeping your eye on out on or keeping your eyes on just to see kind of what happens with them i'd be interested to see if people have already had experiences with them playing or had experiences playing with them or against them to see kind of what their uh what their opinion is based on uh their experiences during that game otherwise thanks for sticking with me on this one i know it was a it's it's just weird to talk about a neutral unit like this that doesn't have that pointed specific 
role or function. And uh, I look forward to kind of moving past these guys and getting on to the next one because this was a really difficult one to talk about. Uh, be on the lookout for, I believe, the Queensmen are probably going to be next, or maybe I'll be doing some Dothraki stuff. I'm just trying to keep in line with the next releases. So uh, I'm, I'm excited people are getting a lot of value out of these discussions, and I look forward to making more in the very near future.